This morning's Bible reading is taken from Romans chapter 8 and I'm starting to read at verse 26. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus who died, more than that who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen.
I wonder what we most wish for ourselves, for our families and for our friends. I guess that one of the things that we might come uppermost in our minds is for a trouble-free life, a life of fulfilment, good health, a comfortable home and happiness. Why is this? Because it's so hard to watch those we love go through difficult times and suffering. It isn't something we relish ourselves either. Paul writes to the Roman church, We know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. It's an amazing statement, but one that can so often be misunderstood and taken the wrong way, often because it's used on its own, away from the context of the rest of the chapter, away from the rest of the letter. It would seem to suggest that if our faith and trust is put in God, then we will be immune from all the problems that beset the rest of the world, that we will somehow live charmed lives. All we need to do is to offer up sincere prayer and we'll have enough money, enough food, a good home, healing for disease, in fact, everything we want. This is known as prosperity theology. The problem is, that it's not based on the teaching of either Jesus or of Paul. Remember what Jesus said to his disciples? He said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. Luke 9, 23. Being a follower of Jesus did not mean that only good things would happen, that lives would be comfortable. Any reading of Christian history demonstrates that fact. Just to read what Paul went through in the book of Acts and his letters shows that he knew far more than most what it meant to suffer for his faith. Yet Paul knew that God's love is greater than all the forces in the universe. As this passage in Romans makes clear, for Paul, faith, hope and love are to be rooted in God's faithfulness, his purposes and his love most of all seen and known supremely in Jesus and in the presence of the Holy Spirit at work in the lives of those who have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. Last Sunday, Martin considered how at the point when the Israelites must have thought that everything was against them, they were trapped between the sea and the Egyptian forces, God made a way for them and led them onwards, rescuing them from their oppressors. It's a great illustration of what Paul wrote in Romans 8, 31 and 37. If God is for us, who can be against us? In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Paul had experienced so much of the worst that life could throw at him since he began to follow Jesus. It could have looked to him and to those around him that the purposes of God were not holding sway, that the powers and authorities Paul speaks of were in charge and not God, and that the mission God had given him was going nowhere. But for Paul, the death and the resurrection of the Messiah and the gift of the Holy Spirit meant that God really was in control and would make a way through for him. And because of that, Paul could stand up to all the circumstances he found himself in. He writes to reassure all Christians, not just those in Rome, that God really is in control of all situations. Essentially, what he says is, who is against us? Nobody. God has given us Jesus and will give us all things with him. Who will bring a charge against us? Nobody. God has justified us and declared us to be in the right and nobody can overturn his verdict when we believe that Jesus is the crucified and risen King of Kings. Who will condemn us? Nobody. Jesus has died, risen and been exalted and intercedes for us. Who will separate us from his love? Nobody. People might try. Circumstances might seem to try to intervene, but nothing in all of creation can separate us from the love of God in Jesus. 
Satan is our adversary, sending all kinds of life-defeating, joy-stealing attacks to threaten the well-being and faith of God's children. Some of these attacks are listed by Paul. Trouble, hardship, persecution, famine, nakedness and sword. But Paul encourages us to stand firm in our faith when those attacks come, reminding us that not only will we win through in the end, but Jesus enables us to win now. Satan lacks the power to steal our eternal destiny and he cannot separate us from the love of God right now. Nothing we face worries God in the least. If we are his children through faith in his son, then we have his pledge of love and protection. In John chapter 10 verses 27 to 29, Jesus said, My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I will give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of the father's hand. No sin of ours and no attempt to the enemy can steal the loving care of God from our lives and that makes us more than conquerors through Christ who loves us. Multiple times in the Bible we see God saving his people because of his love, even when the odds seem stacked against them in a big way. We've already thought of the Exodus. We could then work our way through the books that tell the history of God's chosen people. Judges. For example, we think of Gideon's small band of men who overcame a large army. David overcame Goliath the giant. Elijah demonstrated the power of God against the prophets of Baal. The list could go on and on. These were people who had faith and trust in God, who were bold in their faith because they knew that God loved them. Like Paul, all of these people knew that putting their faith and trust in God did not mean they would never face hardship or troubles. What they did know was that these things couldn't separate them from God's love. As David later wrote in Psalm 118, The Lord is with me. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? And Jesus told his disciples in John 16 verse 33, In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Through his death and resurrection, Jesus conquered the power of sin and death and now sits at the right hand of God, interceding or praying for us, as does the Holy Spirit. Verses 26 and 27 of Romans 8 say, In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. That should give us great encouragement as we seek to follow Jesus and allow him to live through us. We can't do it in our own strength. We may not think that our faith and trust is big enough to be people who live as light in a dark world. But as Jesus taught in his parables of the kingdom, if we have faith as small as a mustard seed, we can do great things in his name if we follow his leading. Note that this is when we follow the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Many times people have thought that when Paul says that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose, this verse means we can grab God and bring him to endorse our own plans, our own ways of doing things. However, a closer reading of Romans 8 helps us to see this is not true. Reading the whole of the chapter, we realise it's not us who are doing the grabbing. Rather, God grabbed us, continues to grab and to hold on to us, to keep us close to him every single day of our lives. It isn't us hanging on to him. He holds us. It was God who took the initiative when he sent his son to die for us because of his great love for us. It wasn't any of our doing. 
It was God who gave us the Holy Spirit to be our counsellor and guide and to remind us of everything that we read in the Gospels about what Jesus told us and what he did for us. When we hold this perspective in view and weigh everything else that happens to and around us against this revelation of God's love for us, then the rest seems unimportant. In his short letter, Jude tells us to keep ourselves in the love of God because he knew that having this would equip the followers of Jesus to be powerful in the kingdom. God chose us and called us to be his children. Isn't that amazing? It is amazing to know that he died for us and sits at the right hand of the Father interceding for each of us. It's amazing to know that nothing can separate us from his love. Understanding this will help empower us to overcome any obstacle life throws at us. Understanding this will release us from the fear that keeps us in chains. David said in Psalm 27 verse 1, The Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? And in today's passage, Paul asks, what then shall we say in response to these things? What is there to say? Thank you, God. Not because he offers us a charmed life, because he doesn't, but because he loves us beyond all measure and will always hold us tight. Throne above, so free, so easy. 